Well, it's good to be back with you this week. I actually had a week of vacation with my family last week, so I'm exhausted today, but glad to be back uh, with you. I did miss being with this church body, uh, worshiping together with you. Uh, it's my hope and my prayer that you also had a good week. I did have to suffer on the beach for an entire week. I got sunburned and all the things that you're supposed to do on a beach vacation, so uh, that, was, that was quite a blessing. Now, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we began talking about who God is and, and really the, the, how important it is that we understand God rightly. I, I talked about as a kid how I had these skewed conceptions of God where uh, we would debate the various punishments God might dole out if we committed certain sins and how really how broken that is, how, fall, how far short of God's glory that really does leave us. And so we looked at God as our Father and we saw Him as a God who who loves us, who cares for us, who pursues us, who adopts us. He is a loving, he is a good father to us. Now, this week, I'm going to give you another portrait of God that the scriptures give us. And we can kind of guess about who God is, uh, but that's not very fruitful. So we're going to look into the word of God and see what the word, the scriptures tell us about who God is and how he interacts with us as individuals. Now, at the end of our time today, uh, we're going to get to do something I, I love to do. Uh, we're going to begin doing this more often just because of what it, the picture that it paints for us, what it reminds us of. We're going to celebrate communion today, and so I'm looking forward to that. But before we dive into communion today, I'm going to ask you to turn. If you got your phone, you may have to dig it out. You're allowed to have your phone in church, by the way. Uh, you can dig that out. You can turn in your paper Bible if you still, still carry one of those around to the 23rd Psalm. You've probably got this one memorized. I remember being five years old in Lloyd Yeager's Sunday school class at the old building in downtown photo. This was on the wall, and he taught us the 23rd Psalm. Uh, I remember memorizing, and it's only six verses long, so you can be like, hey, I memorized the whole chapter of the Bible. There you go. Start with the 23rd Psalm. It's, it's a good one for that. But in the 23rd Psalm, um, composed by David, we see the Lord as our shepherd. Now, before we get too far into that, let's think about who, who David was. You look back into the scriptures, we see that David was a shepherd himself. He knew a thing or two about what it meant to be a shepherd. He'd fought off wild beasts, protecting the sheep. He'd spent the hours out there with them. He'd had to bear with the sheep. I don't know if you know much about sheep, but they're not extraordinarily intelligent animals. They have a tendency to wander off to get themselves into trouble and to be unable to right the, the issues that they've gotten themselves into. Sheep, unlike most other animals, they need a shepherd. They're rather defenseless. They kind of stand out. They're not very fast. They're not very smart. They need a shepherd. And so David had spent much of his young life out tending sheep. He knew what it meant to be a shepherd, and he knew what it meant to be a sheep. So this man, David who as a young boy had enough faith in God that he would step out from the ranks of the armies of Israel among all of these mighty men and these soldiers. He would step out due to his faith in God and he would slay Goliath by the power of God that was at work within him. This young man, he went on to become king of Israel and they sang songs about the, the mighty warrior that David was, that he had slain his tens of thousands. He had a vast kingdom and extraordinary wealth and that man who had accomplished so much looked at God as he began to pen this psalm and he said, the Lord is like a shepherd to me. Which in turn would make David the sheep. Sometimes, we, you know, get a little bit of success under our belt. We've lived a bit, little bit of life. We've got some wisdom. David became king, military victories. I mean, he did slay Goliath. We would have this temptation to think, I don't need a shepherd. I've kind of got my life in, in my hand, right? I've, I've got this thing figured out. I'm doing pretty well for myself. But David was also a humble man because the man who had slain Goliath and also his tens of thousands in battle is also the man that in a moment of weakness had pursued Bathsheba. He committed adultery and had her husband murdered. And he ultimately come to see who God really was and how weak that he really was. Um, if we are going to understand God rightly as our shepherd, we've got to see ourselves first as sheep. Our weakness, how prone we are to wonder to chase after other things, to pursue the empty and broken things of this world. 
And so we see ourselves as sheep. We're not nearly as smart as we often think that we are. We're not all that able to fight off our own enemies. As a matter of fact, we are people who need a shepherd. And so David, the man well acquainted, he begins with these words, The Lord is my shepherd. Now in there is that possessive. He is my shepherd. I belong to him. I'm his sheep, and he is my shepherd. It's a statement of belonging. Now, you may be here today, and you might be thinking, Listen, I showed up to church. I don't know a lot about Christianity or God, but I'm a long way for God. To think that I would belong to him or he belonged to me, you don't understand what's in my story. You don't understand where I've been or the things that I've done. And I would just want, again, to remind you of who David was. He was a guy who had sinned greatly. He committed adultery and murdered a noble man. And yet God pursued him. This is actually the story that Jesus tells us in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 15, he's like, you want to know what the kingdom of God is like? People couldn't understand why Jesus went after the people that he went after and why he hung out with the people that he hung out with. And Jesus tells them a story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and as he counts them at the end of the day, he finds there's only 99. He leaves those 99 sheep behind, and he goes out into the open country, and he searches for that one lost sheep. And maybe you're here today, and you think about yourself, and you're like, listen, I'm not like all these other people. I've been off out there. I've been doing the things. I've, I've lived a life that I wouldn't even want to talk about. Listen, Jesus specializes in finding the lost sheep. He wants to shepherd the sheep that has been lost. He tells us that all of heaven rejoices when one lost sheep is found, And that's true for us as well today. So no matter who you are, uh, where you've been, or what you've done, uh, this is teaching you about who God is and about his heart towards you today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Two weeks ago we saw that God is our provider. He's going to take care of us. But there's a, a deeper part of our desires, isn't there? Like, even if we have plenty of stuff, I, I found myself on vacation this week. Y'all, my family, it, it was a larger crew. It wasn't just me. We ate 15 pounds of shrimp this week, all right? I had plenty of food. There was plenty to drink and eat. Like, every moment I came back in the house, I thought, I need to eat something because that's what you do on vacation. I mean, I, I'm sitting on a beach. The sun is beating down. We've got, we've got nice shades and nice chairs and all the stuff. But did you know that even in the midst of all of that, there's still a longing in my soul for something more. That the things of this earth will never fully satisfy us. But with the Lord as our shepherd, he is the one who provides the things that bring satisfaction to our souls. And with the Lord as our shepherd, it doesn't matter if we have a whole lot of physical things here on this earth or if we have just a few physical things on this earth, our souls don't need want. Jesus is the one who gives us water that we might never thirst again. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. I'll be full. I'll be satisfied. I can be content in him. It goes on to explain that. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Do you know what hungry sheep do? They wander off. They, they're, they're browsers, they're grazers, and they, they're always looking toward the next patch of grass, the next thing. And they often find themselves, if you don't have a good shepherd to keep you gathered up, um, in the open country, lost, unable to find their way back to the herd. And yet, what David says about God is that there is plenty in him. With the Lord as our shepherd, uh, we, we don't have adequate supply of that which we need to live in this life. We don't have just enough to satisfy us. We lie down in green pastures. We have so much that we'll stop searching. Did you know that much of the sin that we fall into in our lives is because our souls aren't full? It's because we're trying to find something to satisfy the deep longings of our souls. Instead of being satisfied in, in Christ and in Him, we go search for all the other things. David's like, listen, I'm a king. I've got a kingdom I've done all the things, I've accomplished all the feats, but it is the Lord who makes me to lie down in green pasture. It is the Lord in whom my soul finds rest. God wants to put your soul to rest. He wants you to rest in him and his provision today. He continues on 
Um, it says he leads me beside quiet waters. That's still waters. Y'all can just take that to the bank with you, right? Leads me beside still waters. For sheep, they're kind of anxious. Um, they're not super logical. They get worried about things that they shouldn't. And one of those things is going to be rushing water. It makes them kind of anxious. They're not as able to drink. They, they can't hear clearly. They're fearful of predators. And so they don't drink all that well when the water's rushing by. And so the Lord is a shepherd. He's saying, he leads me to a place where my soul is at peace. I don't know what you're anxious about today or what you're fearful about today. I don't know what concerns are running through your mind. But in Christ, it's like still water where you can drink and you can be satisfied and you can have peace. Jesus, hey, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Come to me, those of you who are concerned about the illness, worried about your finances. Come to me, those of you who are, who, are, who are burdened with anxiety and all the things going on in this world. And I want to give you rest for your souls. The King David, mega wealthy, super successful, famous as you could be. It's like, you know where my soul finds rest? It's not in the palace. And it's with the Lord. He leads you beside quiet waters. Verse 3, it says, he restores my soul. We live in a world that is broken. Man, if y'all watch the news, we're so polarized. Did you know you're not allowed to be friends with the people you used to be friends with if they somehow have different beliefs than you do? I mean, you watch the news for five minutes. Man, it just grips you, and it's painful. You know, in my life, I, I hate this, but it's true. I've experienced hurt, and I've experienced betrayal. I've known loss. It's, it's the same as you. We go through things. Jesus promised us that in this life we're going to have trouble. There will be trials. There will be difficulty. And yet, it's the Lord who takes our weary soul, our wounded soul, and begins to restore that. That's who God is. That's what he does for us. He gives us rest. He restores our soul. That is found in God alone. He continues, says, He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This psalm has been the thing that I have clung to recently. I'm praying it in the mornings. Y'all, I want to serve the Lord, and I want to live well for Jesus Christ. I pray that I'd be a godly man and husband and father and pastor and friend, and yet I look in the mirror every day and I recognize that I don't have that in me. And rather than being godly, I, I often tend to be selfish. I'm like the sheep that wanders. I don't do all the things that God has called me to do. As a matter of fact, I can't. And so I take extraordinary comfort in the fact that it is God who grabs us by the hand and it begins to lead us in his path of righteousness because we can't do it on our own. You see, it's not our job to find the path and walk the path and stay on the path and monitor everything going on in our lives to make sure that we're doing all the right things. You know what our job is? It's to listen to the voice of our shepherd and to follow him as he leads us in paths of righteousness. And listen, if we could do it for ourselves, we could puff up a little bit, right? Like the Pharisees in the Old Testament or in the, you know, pre-Christ. Like, listen, you could be pretty puffed up on the basis of how well you fulfill the law or not. But we can't fulfill the law. All I do is stumble and fall, and fall so far short. And yet, the Lord is my shepherd. He takes me by the hand and he leads me in paths of righteousness. Y'all, I want to look back 30 years from now, and I want to praise God for how he's led me. I don't want to be a self-righteous jerk of a Christian. Well, there's plenty of those, right? I want to be a man who's followed after Jesus Christ, and I'm so thankful for how he's led me. Y'all, that's who God is, and that's what he's doing. Like, you don't have to worry about your life. You don't have to worry about all of the things and obeying all the rules. That's not Christianity. Christianity is following after Jesus Christ 
walking in obedience to his commands, allowing him to lead you in these paths of righteousness. That's who he is, and that's what he's doing. Would you trust him for that? Would you trust God to make you lie down in green pastures, to lead you beside still waters, to restore your soul? There's a story of Mary and Martha, and Jesus, he comes to town, he's going to visit. And uh, Martha's a little frustrated at her sister, Mary. You can almost, you just know that Mary had to be the younger sister, right? She wasn't as older, as diligent, or taking care of things like the older sister always is. And, and Martha says, Jesus, hey, listen, would you tell my sister to get up and, and like help? I'm trying to prepare a meal, and you're, Jesus, we should be serving you, right? All these things. And Jesus says, listen, Martha, why are you troubled about so many things? And you're worried about this, and you're worried about that. But Mary has chosen that which is best, that which is most important, that which is most valuable. And that's just to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. Y'all, for us as believers, gosh, our lives can get busy. And yet that which is most important, that which is most valuable, is to sit at the feet of Jesus, to know him, to follow him. Listen, we can strive after being a godly man or godly husband, a godly father or mother or employee or whatever you would put foot in that blank. Or we can just sit at the feet of Jesus and begin to follow him and trust that he's going to lead us in those paths of righteousness. It continues here in verse 4. He says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It, it is the nature of life that there are mountaintops and there are pretty deep valleys. The older I've gotten, the more I've realized the, the valleys are even deeper than I ever knew. Seems like the mountaintops are a little further apart. Things get really, really difficult, and yet the thing that we're reminded of here, the thing that David would say, I fear nothing. I don't fear evil. I don't fear the work of my enemies because you are with me. Again, Jesus told us in this life we're going to have troubles. There will be difficulties. There will be temptations. There will be seasons where you're wondering what God is doing. You know, David says, no, 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 not, not what the Lord is your shepherd. You don't have to wonder. He's with you. He's going to take care of you. As a matter of fact, when he talks about the rod and the staff, the rod, um, it's, uh, it's not exactly like what your parents used to whip you as a child, but it was, it was the club that was going to take care of anything that would come against you, right? It was the thing that the shepherd used to defend the sheep. Now, David wasn't like, hey, I'm a mighty warrior. I got this. He wasn't afraid because he was so powerful and so victorious in all of his battles or because he had great armies. He wasn't afraid because the Lord was with him. And if God is for us, who could be against us? Y'all, I don't know what your valley is right now. That thing that feels insurmountable, the thing that you're not sure you're going to be able to get through. You're not sure you can get over that hill or through the depths of whatever you're going through. I want you to know that the Lord is with you. He is a good shepherd and he is leading you and you don't have to be afraid. You can trust him. The rod was there used to uh, fight off any attacking predators, enemies, but then there was the staff which had a crook in it. That when that sheep had a tendency to wander in that valley, to get off the path, to go astray, the little crook could pull the sheep back to get them back where they're supposed to be. And maybe that's what God wants to do in your heart today. Maybe in this valley or on top of the mountain, you've begun to wander. And you look at your life, and it's not been, and it hasn't been what, what you would want it to be. You haven't been following after Jesus Christ. Maybe you've gone astray as a husband or a wife, as a kid, as an employee. Maybe today you're going to feel the gentle tug of that staff where God points you back to that path that leads you to life. Will you trust God to be your shepherd today, to stop going your own way and instead to follow the voice of the good shepherd. That's who God is, and that's what he does for us. We can know him, we can hear him, and we can follow him. Would you trust him in that today? The, the end of Psalm 23, it, it shifts a little bit here. We're no longer in the midst of this metaphor of shepherd and sheep, uh, but instead it turns to this uh, 
the blessings of having the Lord as our shepherd. It's no longer, you know, uh, we're the sheep, he's, he's the shepherd, but instead it's like, okay, this is what real life really is. This is what it looks like for us to follow after God. And so in verse 5, he says this, uh, this is what God does for us. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Y'all, you have feast when there's been a victory. When you've won the battle, you've conquered the enemy, you throw a feast. And so David, he's pointing, he's painting the picture here that in the presence of our enemies, we're going to feast. We're going to be celebrating. It's not us. This is the work of God for us. He prepares this table for us. In the presence of my enemies, it says, you have anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. The uh, anointing of the head was often reserved for the special guest at the banquet. You might feel like you don't belong, but in God's eyes, you're the special guest. He's prepared a table for you. And just put your name in the blank. That God's prepared it. He wants you to walk in the fullness. He wants you to live a life of plenty. And I'm not talking about physical possessions. I'm talking about spiritual riches in Christ Jesus. The best life you could possibly ever live, which may mean you're uber wealthy. And it might mean you're really poor. But it means that you're rich in Him. That you find victory in Christ Jesus over sin and over your enemies and the things that would come against you. You find true life in him. And so God, he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil and our cup. It overflows. And so the expectation of having a shepherd like this, a God who cares for us like this, this is the expectation. This is what we should look forward to in our lives. Verse 6, surely... Goodness. Your, your translation may say mercy or loving kindness. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. If God is my shepherd, this is what I should expect. This is what I'm going to walk in. This is going to be my life. Goodness and loving kindness all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is who God is. And this is what he's done for us. The story of every one of you here, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, you were the sheep that was lost. You were the one who'd gone astray. You weren't following the shepherd. You didn't do all the things right. But God came looking for you, and he found you, and he made you his own. And he spread out a table for us. It's a table to feast on. It's a table of victory. Today, we're going to talk about a table It's the Lord's table. It's the Lord's supper. And what that means for us as believers in Christ Jesus, what the riches that we have in him, we deserved death. But in Christ Jesus, we have riches in his kingdom. And he bore our punishment and gave to us everything that he owned. He gave to us everything we need for life and godliness. He spared nothing because we are now heirs with Christ Jesus. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus has he's walked with his disciples for a number of years, these men who have followed him. And it, it says this in Mark chapter 14, I'm sorry, beginning in verse 22. Um, he's prepared a place for them. He's like, hey, y'all go... Um, find the guy. I've actually prepared this ahead of time. He's got a room for us. We're going to go and we're going to share the the, the Last Supper together. Now, this was the Passover. If you know uh, Exodus, that God led the people, the Israelites, out of their slavery in Egypt. He led them to freedom and and he's going to give them a promised land. That's the whole thing. But um, on the day before God led them out of Egypt, the firstborn of every single home within that region was going to be killed. This was the judgment of God upon the people of Egypt. But the angel of death that was coming would pass over every single house that had followed God's command and taken the Passover lamb and prepared it as God has said. And they they would take its blood and they would spread it on their doorposts so the angel of God would know that they should pass over. And so they would have this feast every year that God didn't take their firstborn, but instead uh, he spared them, right? He didn't didn't kill the firstborn children, but he, he passed over their house. And so this was a feast that happened for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years among the Israelite people. And so Jesus, he sits down with his disciples He's like, I've longed to eat this feast for you. I've actually got a place already prepared, and we're going to sit down and we're going to eat. But Jesus was doing something more. He was 
instituting his new covenant. He was becoming the greater Passover. There was a lamb that was slain whose blood was shed that we didn't have to face death. And that was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he did it for us. He died on the cross that we wouldn't have to endure the just punishment for our sin. Jesus bore that for us. And he did it through his blood that was shed on the cross. And so Mark chapter 14, verse 22, it says this. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. This was a normal Passover meal. They'd done it multiple times with Jesus before. They'd got to share this, or they'd probably done it their whole lives. If they were Jewish, they'd grown up with the Passover. This was, this was standard procedure, but they had no idea how significant this night was. He broke the bread, and he, he gave it to them, and he said, Take it. This is my body. Now, if you were a disciple sitting in the room, you're like, I've heard Jesus say something like this before. Matter of fact, there were big old crowds that were following Jesus Christ before, and then he said, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you can't be my disciple. And a bunch of people had left. And I wonder if this was echoing in their ears a little bit. He's like, eat my, my body. What, what do you mean? That would have been the question on their minds. What is Jesus saying to us? And y'all, they could have never known as much as we know now. They could have never known that Jesus was going to offer his body on the cross, that they might find new life in him, that their sins might be atoned for. So he just says to them, take, this is my body, take it and, and eat. And then he continues on. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. They'd done this their whole lives, but Jesus was doing something greater here. He was a greater Passover lamb. There's a greater feast to be had, and that's what we get to celebrate today, where we look to the work of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. He explains the cup in verse 24. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And they took that cup, and they drank, and they didn't understand fully what Jesus would have meant, but we get to know today that our sins have been forgiven. Our sin has been atoned for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do here in just a few minutes, the deacons are going to come out here and we're going to remember the work of Jesus Christ for us. We're going to receive in ourselves the work of Jesus Christ. Now, listen, when they first did this, when the early church would celebrate the Lord's Supper, they just had a full-on meal it wasn't like a tiny cracker and a little bit of juice. It was a full-on meal. They went after it, right? They feasted. Listen, what Jesus gave us in the gospel, it's not this minute little thing that's only going to last you until next week or tomorrow. Listen, it is sufficient. What we're doing is being reminded of the work of Jesus Christ for us, of the, the banquet that he prepared for us, of the gifts that he's given to us, of what we have in him. So, Maybe you're here today and you're racked with guilt. You've done the thing. You sin against your spouse or your kids or your employer. You've been carrying that. Listen, if, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, let the Lord's Supper be a reminder that His blood covered your sin. Man, if you're here and you're trying to work your way to Jesus, you've been trying to be good enough and you haven't been able to and you feel like a failure and life's just not going the way it should, would you remember the perfect life of Jesus that he lived for you, that he gave to you and says, this is my body, it's for you. We are to be a gospel people. When we look in the mirror, we shouldn't see the brokenness of Jason, the inadequacies and the weakness of me or of you. We should see the perfection of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to do this in remembrance of the work of Jesus Christ for us. We receive this in ourselves as a symbol and a reminder of what we received in the person and work of Jesus. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you're a good shepherd that you lead us in paths of righteousness, that you restore our soul, that you never leave us or forsake us, but you are with us both on the mountaintop and in the depths of the valley. Father, may we be a people who follows hard after you. God, may this be a time of reminder. 
I pray for the person here who's been weighed down by the guilt of their sin today. I pray that they would give that over to you. They'd be reminded that your blood was shed so they didn't have to carry their guilt or their shame anymore. God, for the person who's been working hard for you and just needs to rest in your work, I pray that they'd be reminded of the body that was offered up for us. Lord, may this be a time where the gospel comes into focus, where we see ourselves as sheep. We see you as a good shepherd who leads us and cares for us. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.